Hello, everyone, and welcome to How Do I Start a Career in Robotics, a panel discussion hosted by the UK Robotics and Autonomous Systems Network as part of the UK Festival of Robotics. Please welcome your chair for today's discussion, joint lead at SARAS and managing director at CyberSelves, Richard Waterstone. Thanks, Claire. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Claire was saying, welcome to the 2023 UK Festival of Robotics career panel discussion. How do I start a career in robotics? Uh, as Claire was saying, my name is Richard Waterstone. I'm, I'm an author and consultant on skills and education uh, for robotics and AI. And I was the lead writer uh, on the white paper published a couple of years ago now by UK RAS on skills and education for robotics and autonomous systems. And you can uh, please do download that uh, from the UK RAS network website. Um, I'm also a co-founder of the robotics software startup, uh, now called Bo, uh, that spun out of the University of Sheffield about three years ago. Um, far more to the point, we've got some great panelists here today um, who are far more qualified than me and who I'm sure will be able to answer your questions and give you some good pointers to a rewarding career in robotics. Um, our panelists will shortly uh, tell us about themselves at more length, but if I may briefly introduce them first. Uh, Dr. Helmut Hauser is Associate Professor uh, in Robotics at the University of Bristol and Director of the Farscope CT CDT. Uh, Helmut's particularly interested in morphological computation and embodiment, uh, especially in the context of soft robotics. So welcome, Hel Helmut, and, and many thanks for coming today. Uh, Maria C. Galvez Trigo is a lecturer in the School of Computer Science and Informatics at Cardiff University and part of the Human Centered Computing Research Center. Uh, Maria is especially interested in computational and human robot inter uh, interaction. Uh, welcome, Maria Say. Uh, Katarzyna Sapinska is the portfolio manager in medical robotics at KUKA, where she's worked for the past six years. Uh, first as a mechanical engineer in medical robotics and since 2019 as the portfolio manager in medical robotics for KUKA. So uh, welcome, Katarzyna. And uh, finally, Dr. John Oyakan is the senior lecturer at the University of York and co-chair of the UK RAS Network Early Career Forum. Uh, John is a lecturer in digital manufacturing and a chartered engineer with more than 10 years experience working in applied research and product development in industry and academia. Uh, welcome, John. So uh, first of all, it really might be useful if uh, our, our great panelists just um, say a bit more about themselves and, and their, their varied ways uh, into, into the great job um, of robotics. Uh, so I think to start us off, uh, Helmer, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much um, for this nice introduction. And also thank you to Claire for inviting me today. Um, so where do I start? Um, I think my robotics career actually started already in my childhood. I was very much interested in technology and robots. I was reading a lot of science fiction novels. I was fascinated by the technology in Star Trek. Um, so I was always really keen in understanding a little bit more how we can build intelligent machines. Um, when I was about 14, um, I went to a specific school, which is um, doesn't exist in other countries. I'm originally from Austria, but there's a school where you can go from the age of 14 to 19. You can do your A-levels uh, within the school as well, but in addition, you can also learn a profession. And the profession is in the specific specialization. So there's these types of schools for computer science, for engineering, for electrical engineering. And what I did, I went in there for chemistry. So I had five years of intensive training in standing in labs and um, uh, making concoctions and um, uh, learned a lot about biochemistry, organic chemistry, organic chemistry, and so on. And you might want to say now, what, what has this to do with robotics? But you're going to see at the end of my career, these are things, these are skills that I'm using nowadays as well. So after my IE levels, um, I wanted to go to uni and instead of going to study further into chemistry, I thought, because I'm interested in so many different things, I studied electronical engineering. Um, and I did my specialization in my master's level in control theory, which is very mathematical, but uh, very beautiful as well in its own sense. And after that, I decided to do a, post uh, a 
sorry, a PhD in robotics. Um, and since there weren't too many robotics groups in my university, I went into a group who was working on computational neuroscience. So we were looking mostly at spiking neurons in brains and cats and humans and um, trying to understand how biological systems are computing. So I use this kind of knowledge in there to build systems that are bio-inspired to control robots. And after that, because I did some work in understanding how we can use actually real physical bodies to do computation, I went to Zurich, University of Zurich, um, to a group which was very interested in building smart bodies in order to build smart robots. And I did a postdoc there for four years, um, was a really international group, really interesting research. And then I came to Bristol as a postdoc still, and then I started very soon as a lecturer and um, went through the career steps in the university. Um, along the way, I also was the director of the MSc in robotics here for four years, um, which was really interesting for me because we, I was able to see all different types of robotics that are happening here in Bristol. So we're in the lucky position that we have one of the biggest robotics labs in Europe, and we do all kinds of robotic systems. So we do flying robots, swimming robots, space robots, um, medical robotics, soft robotics, swarm robotics, assistant living, human robot interaction, and so on and so on. So it's really great to see the breadth of robotics and also in order to, to understand my own field a little bit better as well. And since two and a half years now, I'm the director of the Center of Doctoral Training in Robotics and Abdominal Systems. It was, uh, was mentioned before as FASCOPE, that's the, the short name for it, where we have around a little bit more than 50 doctorate students who are working on all kinds of robotic systems. So again, they do all different kinds of things. Some do pure simulation, some are doing theoretical work. A lot of people are building robotic systems, prototypes, but others are using existing robotic systems and do something new with that. And in my group, um, well, we're still using um, intelligent bodies to build intelligent robots, um, and we use all kinds of tools. We use simulation tools. We use uh, a lot of practical building stuff. So we build a lot of prototypes. Um, we use also existing systems as well. And the really cool thing is all the things that I learned before about in electronic engineering, I apply that nowadays in my research as well. All about chemistry, actually, I apply as well because we build systems like these kind of tentacles. They are very soft and you need some kind of chemistry, actually, that you can build those. Uh, we build growing robots where we need chemistry as well. So why my path to robotics actually was like more zigzag than a, like a straight line. I think everything that I picked up along the line was very useful for the things that I'm doing now. And I think that's something maybe you want to learn as well. And even if you don't go into robotics early on uh, and you do something completely different, maybe you go into medicine or psychology, Actually, we do need a lot of people from those fields as well in robotics if you want to shift over and become a roboticist. So I think that would be the summary of my career path so far. Uh, hello, thanks. That's brilliant. That's fascinating. Thank, thank you. And it's fascinating to hear then, you know, how, how you came from chemistry and electronic engineering, you know, into robotics and have in a way then you know lots of parts lead into robotics and lots of parts out of it and um, which everyone would be fascinated to hear about um uh, katagina can you tell us a bit about yourself yes with uh, with pleasure thank you very much for the invitation so uh i just have to to smile while listening to to Helen's presentation about how chemistry starting off from chemistry led him to to robotics because uh, these are also two points in my career that existed um when i went to high school i was uh i went to high school in in warsaw in poland that's where i come from and um, i was very interested in uh, biology and chemistry actually mainly in chemistry so i went into a class specializing in both of these subjects um and then when going deeper and deeper into into chemistry i had the opportunity to work in a, a laboratory at a university um, at a university at that point um, where I tested my interest and I was thinking, hmm, I really enjoy this. It's a beautiful subject, but I'm not sure this is what I want to do at university. Um, at that point, um, I took, I followed my interest through for my entire career, I would say. At that point, I heard that there is a 
very interdisciplinary um, field of study called medical engineering, which combines chemistry and biology, but also mechanics, electronics, informatics, um, where you can explore the broadth of this field and then uh, specialize later. And I thought, okay, this is actually something that interests me a lot. I always uh, like tinkering at home and designing things, building them together. Um, so I thought this would be the way to go. During my studies, um, I was also lucky. I spent uh, one year at the Technical University in Munich during my Erasmus. And there I discovered really the in depth the, the mechatronics aspect of medical engineering. So at the university, there were a lot of projects in minimally invasive surgery, also robotic um, assisted surgery, um, where product design, mechanical design were the focus. And so already in my bachelor thesis, I started going in that direction. I thought okay, I'm very interested in designing new systems. Um, I will take the mechatronics path. Then during my master studies, I started first with a master in, in mechanical engineering. So this was yet another step towards, uh, towards robotics because although I was specializing in modeling um, and um, calculations, um, like finite element uh, modeling, also fluid mechanics in, uh, in mechanics, I was already exposed to also to a lot of uh, courses in the mechanical design, control uh, algorithms, automation in general. Um, from there on, I carried on with uh, combining these two fields and doing another master's in medical engineering, but with a strong focus on, uh, on design and on mechanical design in this field in, uh, in Munich. And there I was um, working as a working student, also doing my, my internships in companies um, doing navigation and surgery, also uh, working with, with robotics for robotic assisted surgery. And uh, there I, I realized that exactly what interests me the most is definitely the robotics aspect and that I think that it's a very booming field. Um, and this is where I would like to go in the future. So after university, as a, um, I was searching for a possibly the most technical um, position I could find because I thought I definitely want to work as an engineer and if not now directly straight out of university uh, then maybe I'll never take the path back. That was what I was evaluating for myself so I, um, I applied and got the job as a mechanical engineer at, um, at KUKA in Augsburg in Germany. So I was uh, working on designing parts uh, whole assemblies for high payload robots, which were later uh, to be used in the in the medical field. Um, this is what I did for two and a half years. It was a very interesting journey because also the beauty of robotics is um, is that it only works in interdisciplinary fields. So even being a mechanical engineer, uh, one is not only exposed to working uh, with other mechanical engineers. Yeah, it's important to talk also to colleagues uh, that are working on the software, who are optimizing the control mechanisms, uh, and people in a lot of other um, departments. Um, and after that, I realized that uh, I would actually like to work on a higher level in sense of um, I can say abstraction level. So maybe not doing the components or subcomponent, but thinking about the entire system. And uh, with my interest also in in business and uh, enjoying um, talking to to customers, evaluating possibilities for um, for products, I uh, moved into portfolio and product management, where I'm working since uh, three years now. Um, which is also a beautiful interdisciplinary part of the robotics on the interface between the market um, and the R&D and the development. Katarzyna, thanks. Uh, really interesting. I I'm, I'm sure everyone's going to hear a lot more about your work in industry and, and fascinating to hear how, how your kind of very varied kind of academic background led so well into that, really. And, uh, and, and also, I think that's something you didn't mention there, but in kind of diversity in engineering now, and, and great to see you in such a senior position at KUKA, and, you know, and, and, and maybe later you'll better kind of help people with kind of issues around how women can be uh, more involved in engineering, which is obviously 
kind of one of the key points uh, in, in the UK at the moment. Um, uh, so, so thanks a lot, Katrina. And now, uh, could we go to John? Uh, John, will you tell us a bit about, about yourself and how you came to where you are? Yes, um, I'm, I'll be glad to, uh, to do so. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, when I hear uh, the accounts of, of, of both our previous panelists, I was just smiling because uh, just like Almut, uh, the, when I was young, I was uh, building robots as well. So I was the kind of kid that look at an electrical appliance, first of all, try to make it work. And then thought to myself, well, hmm, the electric motor in that um, cassette player could actually be used to automate things. <laughs> so yeah, was I like pulling electric motors out of cassette players and combining them together to make um, robots that um, which could be, um, um, yeah, to make robots which were powered by um, um, AA batteries in those days, those big AA batteries. And um, so I got into that. Then in my uh, teens, I I started I, um, and actually before I go into before my teens, I was quite interested in a lot of science fiction. So reading a lot of um, science fiction books, I was quite into my sciences. So in my teens, when I had to um, uh, do my subjects, I ended up doing biology, physics, chemistry, and all agricultural science and 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 math and, and so on and so forth and. I love my sciences so much, and I've always asked myself how to combine all all the sciences uh, together, including my passion for uh, for for, uh, for for robotics. And then I ended up doing um, a an electronics technology uh, degree, whereby I was taught where and um, how to combine sensors, microcontrollers, and um, and actuators together and that's what got me uh, even more interested in, in robotics because i learned that you could develop intelligent algorithms put them onto microcontrollers so microcontrollers are uh, this microprocessor with these tiny um shall i say computers you see in 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 in, in products so those so are you write code for those tiny microcontrollers so that they take all the data from the from from the world process it in a very small computational footprint and then use it to control um, actuators. And in between the sensing and the controlling, you have to develop intelligent algorithms to make sure that um, um, the contraption, in this case, robots that you're trying to develop, um, does what it should do. So that was quite interesting uh, for, for, for me in the sense that how do you uh, develop such, how, how do you develop your algorithms to, to, to solve um, stay or to be to be able to embed them into a very small computational uh, footprint, and then um, I went into industry. So when I finished my um, undergraduates, I went into industry um, for for a while, and there I learned about even more how to do it in a um, in a um, um, industrial setting. So I ended up developing um, intelligent algorithms for for wireless sensors, uh, intelligent algorithms for um, um, for, for, for a variety of things, including getting involved on projects that um, and that looked into how you develop electronic suspension units for for vehicles. So I was I was quite um, involved in a number in a number of projects um, in, in in industry, predominantly developing intelligent algorithms on on these uh, small micro microcontrollers, and that was very 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 interesting because it even sparked my interest even more how you develop intelligent algorithms for a variety of, 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 of devices. And then I ended up doing going to university, doing an MSc in um, embedded systems, and then a PhD in swarm algorithms, in swarm uh, robotics. And um, during my PhD and uh, my MSc, I learned how to develop uh, controllers for unmanned area vehicles. So that's before they became um, very popular. So unmanned area vehicles, drones, uh, the ones that um, uh, you probably see a lot uh, these days. So I ended up learning how to develop intelligent algorithms for, um, for, for, for drones, how you make them fly autonomously, how you enable them uh, to, to land autonomously on a moving platform, how you use um, visual uh, vision uh, to sense the environment and use that to make, to make decisions. So I was able to take all what I've learned so far up to, the, up to that point to develop vision-based algorithms and intelligent algorithms to control these uh, to control this on, on man area vehicles. And what made it even more interesting is how do you control this on man area vehicles in a swarm? 
So a swarm meaning that how do you control, um, how do you, um, a swarm is um, um, a number of drones all flying together, um, more than 10, and, and you, you, you get them to um, orchestrate their movements to do a particular task uh, together. So um, <clears throat> my PhD was looking into how you control, how you develop algorithms, swarm-based algorithms to enable that, that to happen and to enable these um, individuals to orchestrate the activities together, um, enable them to uh, move towards a common goal and achieve a particular um, objectives. So that was quite um, that was quite interesting to me as well. And then the approach I used when I was um, doing my PhD was so. If you remember back earlier, as I was talking, I was saying that I was quite interested in the sciences. So I was quite interested in my biology, in my in my physics, in my chemistry. So I decided to take a bio inspired approach. So learning from biological systems, understanding how biological systems work and then developing, using that understanding to develop algorithms to control multiple um, agents. So <laughs> during my PhD, I, I, um, I looked at the bacterium, how bacterium swarm together to form, um, how bacteria form and um, swarm together on food sources. And that was where I took my inspiration from to develop these algorithms uh, to get on man area vehicles to fly together in a formation. And the idea was if you could get bacteria, I mean, if bacterium could um, could swarm together and form <clears throat> various shapes on, on food sources in the environment, could you use a similar technology or a similar, sorry, could you, could you use a similar concept to get a swarm of unmanned aerial vehicles to fly together and form an invisible pollution. So an invisible pollution, meaning that if there was an hazardous substance in the environment that you cannot see, how do you run away from it? But if you're able to get these drones or this swarm of unmanned area vehicles, if they're able to swarm uh, and if you're able to find the pollution and then swarm and then form a visual uh, representation of that of that um, hazardous substance or that invisible pollutant, then a human being can see where the pollutant is and run away from it. So that was my, that was, so I took my inspiration from, 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 from biology uh, to, to, to do that. And then after my PhD, I ended up doing a postdoc and then I got into uh, manufacturing, manufacturing informatics. And then from there, I started thinking, how do we get robots? Um, to work in manufacturing? How, how do we use robots to improve the efficiency of manufacturing systems, to improve the productivity of, of humans working within manufacturing systems? And ever since then, I've been taking all what I've learned. So coming from um, um, what I learned in my, in my MSc, so the embedded systems, what I learned during my PhD, um, um, SWARM and robotics, and, and, and what I've learned during my team. So um, biology, chemistry, and physics, and then pulling everything across into uh, manufacturing. And currently I'm working on a, an EPS as a funded uh, project called GD Cortex. And what I'm, what, what I'm trying to do there is how do we understand how the brain works, the human brain? How does the human brain process information from the environment and then use that to uh, perform actions. So what I'm trying to do basically is understand how the human brain works using cognitive psychology, understand how the human brain works, and then use that to develop algorithms that will make our robots more intelligent. And the idea is that if you can get a robot that understands how another human being does a particular task, then you'll be able to have better human robot collaboration. So, and, and, that's, and that's the idea for, for, of the project I'm, correctly, I'm currently working on. John, thank you, that was fascinating. Wow. Um, uh, again, nothing like a, a childhood kind of tinkering and, you know, with, with electronics and, kind of, and, and, and it goes to show, doesn't it, it's kind of interesting how important this kind of tangible contact with, with machines really it, it can be you know, to kind of inspire and engage you in technology and, and lead on. And also, uh, you know, then I, I think from what you've been saying, it kind of really shows how kind of varied, really, robotics can be as a potential career. And there's all these applications and and kind of, and, and even more than that, how central 
um, from your work in kind of training algorithms, how it shows just, you know, it reminds us really how central robotics and AI are becoming in our lives and, uh, and in our work, really, and how that can might give people a kind of a, a lot of kind of entrances uh, yeah. into robotics as a career. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and lastly, um, if I could please uh, come ask uh, Maria Say uh, to, to tell us a bit about herself and, and how she came to be where she is today. That'd be great. Yes, of course. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, um, for the invitation to be here uh, from Claire. Uh, my name is Maria Jose Galvez Trigo, that's what you would say on screen. But as Richard introduced me, um, people call me Marise. Nobody really calls me Maria Jose. Um, I was listening quite interested to um, the other panelists, Helmut, Katastina and George, because as opposed to them, I didn't really like chemistry at all. Uh, when I was a child or when I was doing my A-levels. Uh, however, I love mathematics, I loved electronics, computing and physics. And I also love reading science fiction books and disassembling and reassembling things to try and learn how they worked and how they had been built. And I guess my dad is to blame for this because he loves uh, computing, he loves DIY um, building things. So a part of my love I suppose for computing and robotics comes from my dad. Um, I'm from Spain and I studied there my undergrad, um, my master degrees. Um, they were in computer science and engineering. We didn't really have a big focus on robotics although we did do um, industrial automation there. Um, I suppose that's when I started to develop a more serious interest in a career that involved robotics somehow. Uh, although the first time that I really properly worked uh, with robots was briefly in 2013 because I did an internship as research associate at Nottingham Trent University as part of my master's final project. Um, I guess throughout my professional life I've been involved on and off on website development since I was quite young. And after I finished my master's degree I worked as software integrator and video game producer until 2016. So nothing really related to robotics there. And I started to think that that wasn't the career path that I wanted for myself, that I wanted to go back to a robotics related job and I wanted to go back to research. Um, that's what moved me to uh, take the step to come back to the UK in 2016, uh, where I started working in a robotics job at re as research assistant at the University of Nottingham. And from that moment, I suppose I kept working on that. I was working full time, was doing a PhD in rehabilitation and healthcare research um, using robotics. Um, I could, I was sticking as much as I could in my job to robotics and human robot interaction. And um, that is what led me to where I am I today, I suppose. Uh, that was my first lectureship at the University of Lincoln actually in 2022, so not very long ago. Um, that's when I started to have more intensive contact with uh, robotics and doing more um, work in the field with robots. Um, and then where I'm at today, uh, Cardiff University, uh, where I'm lecturer at the School of Computer Science and Informatics. I'm part of the Human Center Computing Research Section, and it's a group in computational and human center robotics. And I am also co-chair of the Early Career Forum of the UK Robotics and Autonomous Systems Network with my colleague, John, that spoke just before me. Um, in terms of interest, because robotics is very wide and as others have mentioned before, it's a very interdisciplinary field. Um, but I'm mostly interested in assistive robotics, which are those that can be used to assist people with various tasks, whether it be on a social or on a physical aspect. Uh, but more specifically, I'm interested in how we can make the interaction between these machines and humans more effective and pleasant, uh, which pertains directly to the area of human-robot interaction. Um, and I tend to work very closely with people that could benefit from using this type of robots, especially with autistic people and with people with learning difficulties or disabilities from all different age groups. Um, I tend to do a lot of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary work myself. I suppose that's influenced my, by my PhD supervisors, which uh, came from medicine background, psychology, human factors. So 
yeah, that's that's pretty much it. But it's there are a lot of ways of getting into robotics, I suppose. And you don't need to be doing robotics as a child necessarily. It could be that you develop an interest later in life. And I'm sure you could have a lot of skills that could be applied to the field of robotics because there's a lot of interdisciplinarity there. So, yeah, that's me. Marisa, great, great. Thank you very much, Marisa. Um, so, 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 yeah, again, you know, it, it's fascinating to hear of all these kind of really different ways into robotics and then as well come out, out, out from robotics, really. And would be, it would be great to get some questions uh, from you all uh, um, for our panellists so they can kind of talk about their experiences more. And I think, um, as Marisa was saying, their healthcare, you know, is, of course, and of course, Katagina also involved in medical robotics is a kind of huge potential future for robotics really um, um, uh, uh, one thing because of the kind of staff shortages in healthcare um, in, in the UK and uh, and elsewhere really and also because this kind of human centered technology really is now kind of advancing so quickly that it has opened up an awful lot of uh, potential opportunities for, for for everybody and and we'd love to hear more about that later um, meanwhile, um, do, do we have any questions we could put to the panel? Um, here we go. Um, so um, our first one from Claire is, uh, what are the best subjects to study at school uh, to, to develop the skills needed for a career in robotics? So uh, who'd like to take that one? I, I can answer that maybe. Happy to do so. Um, I mean, I think what you have seen from from our stories, um, there might not be a specific set of subjects that are needed, right? Um, of course, there are subjects which are much closer to robotics, like computer science, engineering, DD, uh, even physics and mathematics. Um, but um, Robotics, and I think um, Manise said it nicely at the end as well, robotics is very interdisciplinary. We need a lot of kind of input from all kinds of fields, right? If you want to build a medical robot, you need people with a medical background. If you want to build a robot that helps um, autistic people, you need uh, people who understand that. Uh, you need psychologists. Um, so you, you actually can come in from completely from the left field to robotics and then do excellent work. And in my experience, actually, um, I've seen one of the best people coming into the field of robotics are the ones who have not done the classical way of robotics because they come uh, not through the system, so to say, but actually with a new perspective. And therefore, they have a possibility to find new solutions that nobody has thought about because we are in the field so long, we, we're thinking just in this little box. And it's really hard for us to think outside of the box. So. Uh, I think you should do what, what interests you the most and um, and then you will find your way into robotics if interests if, if you're interested in robotics. That, that's the way I would answer it. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's, yeah. that's brilliant. And that's... Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll, I would like to, yeah, definitely support everything that Alma just said. So if, if you see, so what I was saying before was, okay, how do you apply cognitive psychology or biology into robotics? So it's like pulling concepts from a totally different discipline into how you develop new robotic systems. So um, it's, yeah, it's very multifaceted and uh, many um, multidisciplinary, yeah. Um, th thanks. Uh, we'll, we'll move on uh, to uh, Nazia has asked us, what would you say is the most rewarding as well as challenging part of a, a career in robotics? And uh, um, maybe um, Katagina, maybe uh, from your experience at KUKA, maybe that'd be a good question for you to answer. Mm -hmm. A pleasure. Yeah, I was thinking now, so definitely the rewarding part is quite easy and uh, and it's also connected with this interdisciplinarity that uh, in the end, also once one is in the industry, there are almost infinite um, jobs or tasks you could take on. And I don't think, uh, or for, at least for myself, I cannot imagine what uh, would make me uh, bored uh, of working in the robotics because you can uh, work on so many different um, aspects and uh, you can maybe start yeah as an as an engineer move into business or maybe you can move into 
um, usability. You could work uh, also on the topics of ethics and uh, there are just infinite in po possibilities in the in the industry and in the research. I think it's even much more um, and it's very rewarding um, also for from my perspective, working in the medical robotics field um, is just that the feeling that you're investing your time well into something that uh, will hopefully help others. And this is definitely for me the, the, main, the main drive. In terms of the challenging part, I would say that uh, for maybe people with a more perfectionist approach, I don't think you ever uh, can say like, ah, oh, now I learned everything. I'm an expert. I'm satisfied. I can uh, tick that box. Um, so there is always uh, a challenge, new things to learn about in various fields. Once it's hardware, once it's software, once it's uh, electronics, um, usability, there is always something new to learn about. But this is on one side, the challenge and the, the pleasure of it on the other. That's great. Thanks, Katarzyna. And um, any other panelists on the on the rewards and challenges of a robotics career? I think I think for me the, the greatest reward is when something works. <laughs> so you have this idea, and you're thinking that oh, if I apply this concept from this field in this I in this robotics um, um, in this robotics um, problem, it will work. And, and so you have this hypothesis, this, this thinking, and then you just apply it. And then after nights of coding, weeks of working at, and then you start getting the results. That's, you know, rewarding. You're just, I can't describe the satisfaction that comes from there. Uh, of course, linked to that is a challenge as well, where you start realizing that your hardware still needs, <laughs> you don't just, the hardware still needs another level of evolution to be able to do. Um, so one of the things, for example, is manipulation. Um, so robots are not as dexterous as, as human as, as we are. So that's one of the challenges, you know, you want to do something, but there is that hardware block that's still preventing you. So, yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, wanted... oh, sorry. Sorry, Marcy, I was going to say, uh, from my personal experience working in robotic software, things actually working are hugely rewarding as well after after all the trial and error uh, that, that we generally go through. Marcy, say, sorry. Yeah, no, uh, I agree with that. Things working, that's fantastic. And the truth is that they don't always work. So, yeah, that, that I suppose is challenging when they don't work. But if you understand that that's how things are. It, it, it gets easier, but I just wanted to mention rewarding. If you like robotics, you're going to work around the things that you love. And um, uh, especially if, if it's healthcare robotics or robotics that are there to help people, assistive robotics, you are more likely to see a direct impact of what you do. Um, mm. But yes, I suppose I would lie if I didn't mention that um, it's still sadly a male dominated field. And not everybody, not every woman will experience issues or challenges around that, but some will. Um, but I, I guess that the way around that is surrounding yourself by a supportive network of people. And if you really like it, if you really like robotics, then that part of the challenges will be reduced. Um, but yeah, but that's, uh, for me, it has been a challenge at times. Yeah, and it'd, be, it'd be great to talk about that a, a, a bit later. I don't know if any of uh, uh, any of our viewers um, would like to hear a bit more about that. I think that would be a fascinating thing to uh, to go into deeper later. Uh, uh, Helmut, have you got any uh, um, any thoughts on the rewards and challenges? I, I think uh, I, I would agree with what people have said so far. I I think it's also very personal what a challenge is, depending very much on what kind of field you're working in and what the rewards are. Right, if you if you if you do more like simulation work, um, then you try to keep on getting some results there. If you work with people and robotics, uh, it's very likely that the the people aspect is the more rewarding part. Um, what I can say from the academics perspective, um, for me, a very re rewarding part is to work with with young people. So I'm constantly working with new people, fresh minds coming in with very creative new ideas and. And um, this is a very rewarding part that I 
particularly enjoy very much. And this is not particular to robotics, but um, it, it also happens in robotics, obviously. Yeah, that, I think that's all I, I can add here. Brilliant. Thanks, Helmer. Um, so I'm um, moving on. We have uh, Jonathan Walker's uh, posted a couple of questions to us. Uh, first of all, um, if there are any alternatives to Erasmus uh, for UK students, and um, and then he goes on uh, to ask another question of, can you describe the pros and cons of working as a robotics researcher, uh, founding your own startup, or working for a, a large robotics company? Um, I, I can, Jonathan. I, I'm sure you're keen to get on to the panelists' answers on that. But very quickly, uh, I am a co-founder of a startup in robotics, and uh, I'd say for that, the kind of pros and cons of that are. Uh, mainly on the kind of on the pro side, the kind of huge excitement of getting a startup going. Really, uh, we, we spun Bo out of the University of Sheffield, for instance, um, a, a, about three years ago, and, and that first three years when you're just really developing the tech and really kind of getting the applications that get you good contact and engagement with potential customers, and you know you're starting to really build your company is you know one of the most exciting things you can do in life, I think, and. I'd really re recommend it to anyone, but you know, but the, the the cons are definitely the kind of raising of capital, really, to then kind of keep going and and really grow. And uh, and sometimes in the UK, the kind of deep aspect, um, the, the the kind of deep tech aspect rather of uh, of robotics and especially AI, kind of makes that funding a bit hard to access. And you know, often people um, suggest going to California, for instance, where you know where there's definitely an awful a lot more investment in this but um but enough from me anyway can would someone else like to uh, fill a couple of jonathan's questions so first of all uh, alternatives to erasmus has, has anyone got any ideas on that yeah so actually uh, in the uk a lot of institutions you will find that they have agreements with foreign universities um sadly we are not part of erasmus per se anymore but there's still those agreements there. So for any students wondering if they can do um, a year abroad thing, I could encourage them to just approach their own university and, and see if they offer such a thing, uh, because many of them do. And um, I could really recommend it. I did it twice during my studies and I learned a lot, really a lot. And that's what brought me back to the UK because I did my one exchange year here. So, yeah. That, that's great. And, and and in terms of being a researcher and working for a large robotics <laughs> company, um, Katijin is obviously uh, the one to answer the large robotics company question. Yeah, so definitely um, working for a large robotics company, it's one advantage is for sure being um, exposed to and being able to reach out to a lot of experts in various fields meaning um, even if you, from, from the perspective, how, how I remember it when I started the career, it was great for me to have so many experienced people around, just a team's message away, no matter what was necessary, and that offers you infinite uh, learning possibilities. The second advantage is that uh, you can, if you work um, in a field, you can really focus on uh, on what you're doing and um, so for example working as a mechanical engineer i imagine in a startup you don't only focus on the design yeah you have to also cover a lot of other fields i imagine i never worked for a startup that i have to say in, in a large company you know that uh, you work always with experts in the respective fields. So as a mechanical engineer, you work with an expert from production, with an expert from uh, product management, with uh, somebody um, taking care of the, also of the um, uh, purchasing of components, negotiating contracts with suppliers and so on and so forth. Um, so this is also great exposition to a lot of um, expertise. And later on, it also um, gives you kind of a confidence that the chances are very high that uh, what you are working on uh, will reach a lot of customers in the in the whole world. That's a, that's a great point. Thanks, Katarzyna. And, and, and in terms of the pros and cons as working as a researcher rather than in a large company or a startup? Yeah, I wanted to mention as researchers, you could either work in academia or in industry. And 
from friends that I had and people that I know working as research in the industry is very different from working in academia. In, in academia, we also face the challenge of funding, especially when we move on to our uh, academic roles as researchers and similarly to startups. Um, but I suspect in industry, it depends on whether you work in one company or another. I've heard a bit of everything. I've heard horror, horror stories from academia, from industry, but also fantastic, amazingly happy stories from both sides as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think <clears throat> I haven't, uh, okay, I think I can, I can. So I haven't worked actually in large startup and, a, and as, as an academic researcher, each of them. So as, an, um, as a robotics researcher, I think the beauty of it is that you can generate ideas, any cool, any crazy ideas you want, you can generate it. And as long as you have the facilities to try them out, you can, you can go ahead and do it. Of course, you need to also look for the funds and the money and the PhD students and the postdocs, and that's where the challenge is. In founding your own startup, as um, Richard said, is, 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 uh, is great. You're able to raise your money, it's is, is, is brilliant. Of course, the challenge of that is making sure that your staff members that you've, rec that you've recruited to join your bandwagon, making sure that they, have, they are paid monthly, which means that you have to always keep thinking about raising funds, raising funds, raising funds, raising funds. So it's very similar to us as academics trying to <laughs> write the next grant to keep our, our, our group going. And then working for a large robotics uh, company, I guess you have a lot of resources at your disposal, but the problem with that is that there's less flexibility of, of and please correct me if I'm wrong here, um, um, Katrina, there's less flexibility of you saying that, oh, I want to do this cool idea because everything is driven by the business needs. <laughs> so you have to, whatever the boss says and whatever the business need, need, wants, you've got to do it. And then, but you'll be supported by a lot of resources. Maybe to add on that, sorry. Just to, to add on that, saying that also, you know, in the in the industry, every company depends where you are. Yes. If you're working in the part of the development that has to deliver products on timeline, then there is less room to play. But uh, yeah. companies also invest a lot of innovation. Yeah? And there is also basic research, corporate research and so on. So there are also lucky engineers working for uh, for huge companies that get to experiment uh, a lot. That's great. Um, so moving on to, to Klaus, Lex um, has asked us um, if there are any tips for engineers working in the industry who like to leave the applied fields for more fundamental uh, theoretical research and who don't have uh, research experience. So to someone working in kind of more applied robotics at the moment, uh, who'd like to go more into theoretical research, but doesn't really have the, the, the research experience. Um, and any advice for them? Um, and publications does seem to be a, 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 a good idea from Klaus around that. I I guess you could do a, a postdoc and Almut will be able to correct me here <laughs> because he, yeah. So I think, I think, I mean, I mean, academic researchers or labs are always looking for people who are very experienced in, in doing things. And I think if you can show in your CV that you have a particular skill set that a, a postdoc post um, um, requires, then I think that could be your entry point into into academia then of course when you get into academia then you have to sort of start thinking about how you um, create hypotheses how you go about testing them and how you go about developing um, uh, robotic systems to, to test those hypotheses and then that will lead to your publications so i suppose it depends on whether you have already a phd or not because if mm -hmm. you don't have it uh, there are ways into academia, because I got my first post as research assistant without a PhD. Um, so there are definitely options, but I would say that if you really want to move onto that field, uh, going for a PhD could probably open more doors. Um, but in the end, you, you need to decide if you want to go that route or not, because, yeah, doing a PhD is, is a job on itself. Mm -hmm. And... So, yeah, but, but there are definitely routes. And I, I know also some 
uh, industry jobs give you certain freedom to move within the same company to different roles. I don't know if KUKA is one of those, uh, but I'm aware of some that allow you to move roles within the company if you want to move on to a more theoretical um, side of things. So, yeah. Um, Speak and, to and, people and, that work in the area. Sorry. And, and would it be the case, do you think that academia would kind of welcome people with this kind of applied experience? And Helmut, what do you think? Absolutely, yes. I, I think especially if you... If you're in the engineering, for example, it's um, um, you can come from industry and uh, and start a career there, right? If you have a PhD before, you can start as a lecturer there or even higher up there. I think this additional experience is very much appreciated. And the robotics is, I mean, it sounds a little bit like these are different kind of fields, like more applied or fundamental, but they are connected somehow, right? Even if you do very fundamental research, in robotics, you want to show that it works, right? You want to build something. So having actually some kind of knowledge on how to build prototypes is actually beneficial. And the other way around, if you if you want to solve a problem that is specific for solving a problem that the market needs to be solved, you need some kind of theoretical work as well. So in, in a company uh, or in collaborations in project, you want to have this information flow anyway. So a good robotics project includes more fundamental researchers and more applied researchers and they work together to, to build something new. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just I saw mean, that Klaus commented that doesn't even have a master's yet and meant that PhD requirements often stay publications already. But I'd say as a master's student, um, if you intend to do a master or even in your final year project as an undergrad, you have an opportunity to prove that you're interested in the field and that you have the skills. And I supervise master's students that have um, produced publications from the project and also undergrad students. So you don't need to have a PhD to have publications if you are really worried about that. And I'd say you don't need publications to access a PhD program. You need to show that you are really passionate about what you want to do and either apply for an advertised position or produce your own research proposal and show that you you know what you are doing in terms of looking up the literature review and what is being done and the ideas that you want to develop. So although a lot of positions listed as a requirement, I'd say yeah. it's not really a requirement, at least not for all of them. I would say the same. So for our doctoral program, um, where you get a scholarship and, and money for research and everything, it's not a requirement at all. Um, mm. it, it's also... it's. If you are an undergraduate and you write a publication based on your project or a master's and you write the publication, it's maybe you did the work, but under very close, tight supervision. So this doesn't prove that you can do research, right? It's um, it might be, but it, it, it uh, actually doing a PhD is teaching you to how to do proper research. That's the whole idea. Mm. <laughs> so it, it's I know there's a trend of that that people are requiring uh, there's a lot of competition. That they they're requiring additional kind of publications before you start the PhD, but I, I think it's it's a little bit silly. It's it's this kind of classical, you need ten years of experience and of I don't know program language, and it existed since five years. You know these kind of things. I agree. <laughs> That's great, thanks. So, class, maybe you should get in touch with a couple of our panelists here. Maybe that could be the best way in for you. Um, so, so uh, another question here from so from Simrat Singh, Singh this time. Uh, so Simrat says, being from India, I don't have a lot of opportunities here. I've just completed my BTEC in CSA and AIML and made my own personal humanoid. Um, how can I find jobs in this industry? Uh, Simrat, that sounds hugely impressive so far. And uh, I, I'm sure you'd be kind of really attractive to industry here. Um, personally, a personal bit of advice is there's nothing like sometimes just looking at all the companies, looking up all the companies you'd really like to work for and, and writing to them and introducing yourself, really. And even if they haven't got um, anything uh, available for you right now, you know, you can go on, on their books and, and find they get in touch with you later. And, you know, generally there's a dearth of, of people um, with, with, with skills and experience such, of, such as yours. So I wouldn't be too disheartened. And and personally, I'd say just get really stuck in and kind of introduce yourself to as many people as you can. Uh, but I'm sure some much better advice um, from some of our panelists on this. Uh, 
uh, anyone with any ideas about um, what, what you can do? Yeah, so, yeah, I would agree. I would, I, would, I would agree with what Richard said. I think he's, he's contacting the, going to business shows, you know, business shows, introducing yourself to them. Maybe when you go there, you sort of take your, your phone with you. It's a video of what you've done. And you talk about the technical um, um, challenges you had to deal with and how you went on to solve it. So I think if you're able to do that, I think that would be that would be good if you create something like a website as well or a YouTube video. So when you contact these um, companies that you want to work with, you, you're able to put a link to say, oh, look at what I've done. And then that will also help them. That would ginger up interest in them and, and, and get them to contact you. So I think this is, um, and don't and, and don't be. Um, the, the, I mean, it's, it's up to you. But if you want to look internationally, don't just um, um, localize yourself in India. Cast your net wide as well, and um, look abroad. That's true. And 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 often, uh, and often companies really like to look at. I mean, I know in, in our hiring um, at the company I work with, kind of. If someone's done something on their own, like um, made their own humanoid um, out with uh, academia, that's always really, really interesting to people. And, and we always really like talking to people who have kind of, you know, got stuck in really in their own time on their own projects around this. Um, um, anyone else? Yeah, it's much more worth than a publication, for example, <laughs> that mm. you can show something that you build something. So that's really impressive. Mm. And also from from my point of view, I think. Um, Sometimes, I mean, different companies have different, um, uh, you can say, formulas for applying, but definitely what catches uh, a lot of attention if somebody has uh, like a portfolio attachment yeah, and writes what did they work on, what did they learn, what was their job in certain projects, this is definitely good. And uh, then I would also support the advice of just... Um, going out there and uh, trying to meet people from the industry. There are not only maybe like um, trade shows um, are not the easiest way because you don't always maybe meet the, the right people, but there are plenty of other events co-organized by, by university. Um, so definitely attending events, many of them are virtual, so uh, it doesn't even matter where you are. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good support fun. that. Give visibility to yourself. And nowadays it's relatively easy if you have internet access. You can also write a blog and describe how you made your own personal humanoid, what it is that it's the process you followed, or the, the novel things that you applied. And you can try and give visibility to yourself as well that way. Um, of course, in terms of opportunities, it depends on whether you want to move or you want to stay where you are, but a lot of companies also offer remote jobs if you are involved, for instance, in the software side of things. That's true, great advice. Um, uh, so moving on, we have another question from Jonathan Walker. So he's asking uh, if there's a sector uh, that robotics can be applied to uh, that we see as having high potential for growth in the near future and that would also benefit uh, for robotics specialists. Uh, and and how um, and and how to go about that basically. Um, uh, straight off as well, I, I'd say again that um, what our panelists were talking about earlier, kind of uh, it seems to me, healthcare, social care, medical robotics is one uh, that that robotics is being uh, applied to, and there's a, an awful lot of growth uh, in that sector, uh, and and as well, it has really ben benefited from robotic specialists. Um, maybe we could hear a bit more about that and any other fields that um, our panelists. Um, describe i think um what we see is a little bit a trend away from because robotics has been very very successful in the industrial context assembly lines for example um the the problem is that the type of robots that we use there are very specific they're, they're rather stupid uh, but it's okay because uh, the task is just moving back and forward and doing the same things and they don't have to deal with humans with uncertainties they're behind fences um, but there is more and more a push to free robots and actually introduce them into your environment, right? The classical human robot that uh, washes your dishes or fills your dishwasher or cooks for you or these kind of things. And it's surprisingly difficult 
to do. But in all those fields where robots are outside of factory floors, be it with humans, be it in agriculture, be it in uh, environmental maintenance, uh, be it in firefighting, be it in um, sea exploration, exoplanetary exploration, all these kind of things have a huge potential for growth if you solve these underlying problems there. And uh, especially, I think, um, in, in, in the Western world with the ancient society, everything is connected with health, right, and elderly and assisted living and, and therefore medical robotics. And, um, and um, so a lot of things currently are... are been done in, in, in soft robotics, which is um, a reasonably emerged field. And this is what I mentioned before that what we're doing as well, but other, so many other people as well, where you use soft structures to build systems that they can be actually put on the rope, on humans, into humans when you operate on them or on animals or if you pick fruits and so on. So I think there's a huge potential there. But uh, real robotics is really hard. It's, it's mm. not easy. They're not very, yeah. there are very few successful robotics uh, companies around. Um, they're the big ones which make robot arms and they do other stuff as well, right? But um, there are very few who are really, really successful besides Roomba and also they have some issues as well. So, uh, but we hope we can change it in the future. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose <clears throat> because of that, it is important the interdisciplinarity of <clears throat> profiles because, yeah, a lot of Roboticists focus on what the robot can do, how the robot can tackle a problem. But yeah, we have that issue of robots being around people and yeah. handling an environment that is very unpredictable by nature. Um, yeah. yeah. And people also interacting with the robot and how they perceive it. So yeah. I mean, one of the things um, we certainly see from manufacturing itself is that. Um, as Almut says, the majority of these robots have been in cages, but you want to get them out of the cage to be able to work alongside people, you know. And the reason for that is because manufacturing, um, if, if a particular product is well defined, then yes, you can use the DOM, <laughs> every program, um, and robotics that we've been using from the past, but whereby we start moving into a mass production of personalized products, whereby products we need to be changed very rapidly based on upon customers needs and that's all the approach of <clears throat> using and pre-programmed robots don't work anymore you need to be able to be and you need to be able to rapidly rapidly program a robot maybe the same way you show another human how you do a particular task you know and if you can show this robot oh this is how you do this then that robot can teach another robot <clears throat> or you teach it a, 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 I mean, a, a number of robots together. This is how you do a particular task and those robots go ahead and start doing it. Then that way you start having a, a manufacturing environment that is very flexible, that is flexible automation. And then you can use, um, you can basically use the same type of robot to make a variety of products and a variety of things. But for that to happen, you still have this, um, you still need this human robot collaboration. And how do you develop the algorithms to support that? Um, that is still um, which is a challenge in itself. I would also say that, uh, and of course, I would say just definitely medical robotics, because it actually also combines two of the other aspects that were mentioned. Yeah, like no human is the mm -hmm. same meaning you are always working uh, in an environment that is new and very often unpredictable. Um, so the, the assembly line approach doesn't work. And you have humans moving around, maybe not only the human being operated on, but the entire staff. So the, the interfacing with other humans who are trying, with humans that are working on the same task as the robot uh, is also very important. And these two aspects, Yes, are gaining more and more importance also in the industrial world, uh, where uh, flexibility um, and ability to work with uh, with humans is uh, yeah is key. Thanks, Christina. That, that, that's great. And, and the next question actually, um, probably should come straight to you as well. Um, possibly uh, that it's it's a then a lot more. Um, particular about medical robotics, basically saying, so Matt Maxim's asked us a question that whether we can share our experience of how difficult it is to conduct preclinical and clinical trials uh, of medical robots, and how difficult it is to certify them. Yeah. So I can uh, share the experience, so to say, uh, from, from second hand, 
because uh, what KUKA does is we provide robots that are components into medical devices. So on top of the KUKA robot, you can build a massage application or a knee surgery or a, or a spine surgery robot. So we know this experience from, uh, from our customers. Um, and I would say that it also depends on the market. Uh, you are you are targeting in the entire certification process um, how complicated it is, and of course also the the application you are targeting. Yes, so uh, so we see that um, yeah, customers going into more complicated fields where safety and uh, mm, or maybe an error of the system could cause um, a big harm to the to the patient take much longer in the development and then later in the in the testing than other applications in which in which the robot is maybe just having an assistive um, function so it really depends on the final final application that's great and, and, and john i know you've got to to go uh, sadly in a moment um is there anything you'd like you, you could kind of um before you go uh, tell us about um, yourself and it kind of ideas generally for everyone uh, in the audience? Yeah, I think oh, what I would like to say is that robotics, working on robotics is, is very exciting and uh, we'll definitely encourage it as a, as a, as a career path to, to anyone. Um, I, I saw one of the questions about, oh, how, um, I mean, how, how, whether, whether a particular final year project is the right one or not, what I would just advise is that as long as you are passionate about what you're doing and you are learning, how to create those robots, those, those lessons you learn will always be helpful in whatever career prospects that you choose. So for example, I, I, I mentioned earlier in the, in the talk that I, I, I went to industry, I mean, I've, I've worked in industry um, a, a number of times during my career. And while I was in industry, I learned about how to create embedded systems, how you write um, software to put onto very small computational footprints. Um, and microprocessors, and that's been helpful because um, I think one of the um, um, one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that when we are creating algorithms or, or software in general, we have to make sure that um, we have to remember that uh, we don't create these long, <laughs> just long lines of code. They have to be compact. They have to be computationally efficient, and that's been helpful for me um, when when I look at problems in robotics. So taking a bit of of what I learned in the industry, various things I've learned throughout my career and bringing them together to solve problems have, have been quite helpful uh, for me. That's great, great. Thanks, John. And uh, Claire's just put kind of this question up that you, 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 you quickly mentioned. Uh, I just started my final year in mechatronics automation, currently working on building a Rubik, Rubik's Cube solver robot. Wow. Uh, I don't know if it will help me or not. Uh, should I do something else? I mean, personally, I'd say, as before, if you can show future employers and things amazing projects like this, it tends to kind of get, get, get you apart from the crowd, really. And I think mm -hmm. I think what we're all looking for is, you know, people who just want to kind of out, out of their own volition really get stuck into something and and really kind of show their interests through projects like that. But um, but but perhaps John and the rest of the panelists, you'd have some different advice to that, or. I completely agree. I think if you can show that you build something on your own, you come up with your own kind of solutions and and then it's also about selling it as well, right? If you have an interview for a scholarship for a PhD or something like that, you have to show that what you did there was, which part was your own, which was the creative part. And it shows you passion for robotics. And I think we, for example, in our CDD program, when we, when we give away scholarships for PhD students, we look very much for people who are different. So we um, we we don't look for people only who just did well mechanical engineering undergraduate and then masters and and uh, and then now they want to do a PhD or they did an undergraduate in robotics and then they want to do a PhD in robotics, but rather I personally prefer people who actually who show their passion of despite they've done something different right or they went to the industry and come back to do a PhD which is much less money than they did there. So they did actually had to make a decision based on their passion and uh, because they really, really like doing a PhD in robotics and not because it's just the next logical step uh, and everyone is doing that. 
so having one of those projects is 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 great, um, um, which can you can use to to demonstrate when you talk to people, right? Uh, if you meet up with people, or if you reach out to companies, or or um, if you want to get a PhD or or an MSc um, for a very prestigious program, you, this is exactly the ones that you use in your cover letter to show that you're different. Uh, John, before you go, have you got any any ideas on that? I agree very much with that. I mean, if if I mean, yes, your passion is what sh shines true. If you're passionate about robotics, I think, yeah, the world is your oyster, should I say? <laughs> and you just keep keep, yeah, show employers, show PhD and you know, your PhD advisors that yes, you have the passion for it. You've done. Um, some some very cool stuff, and that will open doors for you because that's what robotics is about. Don't forget, it's all practical at the end of the day. So taking things from whatever discipline and then introduce um, implement them in robotics. We, yeah, if you show your passion, I think that would be brilliant, and that will open doors for you. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, and sorry I have to. I leave now. It's been a pleasure speaking to everyone. Take care. Um, so moving on there, we've got a, a question here from Shreya uh, Sinha uh, asking, are there any tips on when's the best time to start preparing for a career in robotics? Uh, we heard a bit more, I think, from John earlier that from birth he was tinkering with things. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I'm not sure personally that, that, that at any time is too early, but um, but over to the panelists. I'd say any time, any time is too early. No time is too early, but there's never too late either. So I know people that went into robotics for the career that they love quite late in life, and there's nothing wrong about that. I mean, this. I, I also heard some people uh, say, no, I'm too old for this, but that's not true. So anytime, whenever you decide that's the thing you want to do, well, that's what I would I, say. I agree. And personally, I, I only really uh, entered robotics about 10 years ago. And so I would definitely argue mm -hmm. you're not too old and you can do it later in life. Yeah. I, I can't agree more. Uh, anyone else? Katarzyna, what, what do you think? And I would time? also say there's it's never late. It's never too late. Yeah, I would say it's never too late because uh, as we spoke before, there are just so many different ways into robotics and in the industry. I also have plenty of colleagues who have worked first multiple years um, in a different industry sector. Yeah, and they what they brought to the company is also a lot of application knowledge, which is uh, also very important yeah so um, it's never too late and uh, there are people coming into robotics really i think from every imaginable field absolutely yeah. i think that's Maybe. a really important point and, Turin, and as helmet you, you were saying earlier weren't you that actually you like looking at candidates who have gone out and got a bit of kind of life and industry in the real world and come back and these were the best PhD students that we had so far. So <laughs> it's it's based on, on the experience that we had with them. Um, maybe I, I can also add something. Uh, if you already know you want to do something in robotics, um, you don't have to wait. Be proactive, right? Uh, think about ways to improve your CV, uh, ways to engage with people. Uh, Manis had a really excellent idea with the, with the web page, with some videos, uh, what you're doing there. Um, bring your card with you with a QR code on it so people can immediately watch the videos and so on. So I think be proactive uh, about it. Um, talk to people. I think this is good coming to this panel discussion, get more information um, and, and understand a little bit the landscape uh, because it's very often, for example, with our PhD students, right? They're not sure if they're going to stay in, acad uh, in academia or they go into industry. And, and sometimes we have this picture in our head without actually having experienced it. So I always say, Go out, uh, go there for, uh, stay for three months there and experience industry and see if you like it or not. Uh, try out teaching if you want to stay in academia, right? Maybe you don't like it, so you shouldn't stay in academia, for example. Um, so you have to try that, test it out. Find internships, for example, is also a really good way to get uh, to know people and then they see your passion for robotics and they maybe offer you a long-term job as well.
I think you're muted. I'll unmute. Uh, on to the next question. Uh, so uh, Patrick Holthouse uh, has, has kindly got in touch and he's asking, what advantages do UK PhD positions offer to overseas students? And basically, why come to the UK to do research here? So I, I wouldn't say that anybody would have an advantage over all the PhD students because they did their PhD in the UK. But I can say that certainly the UK academia in the UK is very active in robotics. Uh, whilst in other countries, maybe it's not that active. So that, that could be a good point, uh, a good option for them to choose to come here. But in terms of quality, if you find a PhD, uh, advertise in any other country or you find like a research lab in any other country that does what you want to do I'd say yeah I mean the UK is good I'm here I love it here but it's not the only place in the world so. uh, 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 Marisa I, I think that is the point uh, other panelists isn't it that really maybe it's just the robotics in, in UK universities mm -hmm. is, a, is a kind of more of a featured subject really and a specialism yeah, I agree. There's a lot of activities on robotics in, in the UK. Um, hmm. So there are a lot of really strong groups as well, right? You, you want to yeah. go to a place where you have more possibilities afterwards as well. So looking a little bit into that as well, if you if you want to do a PhD um, and not just looking at the name itself um, and talk also to people who are doing their PhD there, uh, understand how a PhD student feels in those groups. I think this is very important as well. And uh, like everywhere, there are good groups, good supervisors, bad supervisors. Um, you have to find. You you should not just assume it's it's a good group because the university name is big or the country is big name in robotics. Uh, mm -hmm. Make sure you you do your due diligence and and get more information from people who are actually working there. Um, I agree with that. Um, brilliant and. Uh, and then from Maxim there, Maxim has asked if we can recommend any Scopus journals with free publications on robotics. Is that any, anyone got robotics any Robotics is very that? broad. So I'd say <laughs> robotics is very broad. So it depends what area of robotics you are interested in, really. So for instance, I'm really interested in social robotics. So there's the International Journal of Social Robotics. But then you have some journals that not all the publications are open access. So even just using Google Scholar could be a very good starting point. And then from there, find what are the journals that appear the most in, in the, for the topics that you are really interested in. Or even looking at people, if you know that somebody works in that area, looking at the places where they publish um, and maybe check in that conference and that journal if there is anything else that could be interesting. But I don't know if the rest of the panelists have different advice, but that's. I think it's a good advice to start with Google Scholar. And usually when you click on it, there's a PDF link if it's available. Mm -hmm. And very often the PDF link goes to the university web page, um, yeah. which is basically a pre-published version, which is free in a lot of times. Um, and so it's not the fancy version, but it has all the information in there. Um, and also, if you don't find a paper, reach out to the first author, which is usually a PhD or the postdoc, and uh, they're very happy to share their, B their BDF with, with you because they, they're just happy that somebody reads their work. <laughs> so don't be shy to reaching out to them. It's, with emails nowadays and the internet, you're one step away to get this kind of information. Uh, another quite particular question uh, around kind of academic paths uh, uh, into the into robotics career here from Ashwin Kumar, uh, and, and Ashwin asks that he says he's currently pursuing a master's in robotics at the University of Sussex, primarily working on autonomous mapping algorithms. Uh, how should he navigate his career prospects? And are there any particular companies in the, in the UK uh, that, that we know of? Um, any ideas on that? So, um, how, how... I, I mean, all big companies do robotics to a certain extent, and and Donald's mapping is, I mean, this is British Telecom is doing that, Toshiba is doing that, Dyson is looking for a lot of people recently to build robots. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, um, there are a lot of 
like infrastructural companies use this kind of technology as well. They only use robotics, right? And if it's a big enough con a company, they have a research department where they have robotics as well, if they're not directly applying it. Um, nuclear decommission companies, they use that as well, mm -hmm. very likely. Uh, security companies, um, I, I think... Even if you don't use exactly what you did there, if you use some kind of machine learning, right, you can apply it in, in almost any any kind of company, uh, even if they don't have physical products. So I think, yeah, there are a lot of possibilities, basically. I think you're unmuted, Richard. Sorry, uh, let's move on because we're, we're about to uh, finish in a minute. So I think Claire has asked here a really great question that uh, might be a really good one to kind of for people to um, finish on, and uh, which is basically what experience or opportunity was the most important or defining for your career so far? So I think this is something people might find really interesting. Uh, Katrina? <laughs> good, very good question. Hmm. Oh, I think... It's never easy to point to this one single thing, but I think always the earlier, the more uh, impact it has. So I think for me, it was really um, taking part in this uh, exchange in the Erasmus program and just going abroad and uh, realizing just how, you know, how inter or like what interesting things are done uh, out there yeah and uh, just uh, moving out of your initial environment and your comfort zone and just uh, broadening your horizon and then it really opens your eyes to the amount of interesting jobs you could be doing in the future yeah and uh, helps you maybe to to dream to dream bigger yeah i couldn't help but smile because for me it was the same an exchange year coming here to the UK was the first time I did any robotics. Um, but also it was challenging. You're out of your comfort zone, as you mentioned. Um, but but really, yeah, helps you see things, see challenges differently. So I'd say that was also the most defining moment in my career. I, I also did Erasmus in Spain, in San Sebastián. So um, it was obviously a very uh, interesting interesting year and and maybe not so much for robotics for me but it was very defining for my life um, but i think the biggest opportunity i had when i was at the as a postdoc in zurich um, where my line manager was extremely open and um, let me do a lot of stuff um, so he was very much Hands off, um, but always supportive, and which gave me a little, a lot of confidence in trying out new things. And I tried out a lot of new things, and quite a lot of them failed. But uh, I always had his support, and this was he was a really, really good mentor um, that still shapes the way that I think about research and about people and leading people and so on. So I think uh, he had the most impact in my career on that. Um, it was Rolf Pfeiffer, by the way, if, if someone is interested. <laughs> That's great. Oh, good. Thanks, Helma. Another question has just come through from IDK uh, saying, uh, I'm pursuing my BTEC second year uh, and I'm new to this aspect, don't know much, but how can someone join any space organization uh, in this domain? Uh, is, is there a procedure? Um, I, 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 um, if you're talking about space, and let's, let's have misunderstood it, that another kind of uh, hugely growing um, application of robotics um, and anyone got any ideas on this uh, helmet did you come across much um the many space organizations or well people so we have students phd students who work on space related projects um mm -hmm. and they are so they are phd so um there's a little bit different level but there are student organizations who are affiliated with asa for example european space agency um, I'd students go to chat proposal lab, for example, in California. So this is not so much as an organization, but there are a lot of possibilities. I think the best if you go to ESA, to the web, but chief in Europe, uh, if not to your national or regional space agency, 
usually there are a lot of kind of outreach activities and newsletters, and then they have some organizations where they involve uh, people at different levels of their mm -hmm. career. Um, and there might be events that you can go and, and, and meet and greet. Um, that would be a way into that as well. And another possibility is to look at specific research groups who are working on that though. So there are specific universities that have contracts with space agencies where they do certain things, maybe satellites or maybe rockets or spacesuits. Um, so they have special contracts for a longer amount of years and they have special labs and you can reach out to those, for example. Okay, I wanted to say if you're into the software side of things for space, I know they use a lot ADA, ADA, programming language. So if you have even a ba basic knowledge of that, you would probably stand out against other people if you apply for jobs in space industries. Really good advice. Um, Katarzyna, is this something you know anything about? Unfortunately, here I cannot share any any wisdom. Um, would you be able to? And so, I mean, just as we're wrapping up, and what do you think about people who might be interested in joining Kuka or, uh, or 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 a similar company? What would your advice to them be? I would absolutely recommend. <laughs> it's uh, you should you should make your choices uh, wisely. I would say, and I mean, of course, choosing the you should first. Choose a company where you like the products or feel inspired by by what they are doing. And I, I personally think that Kuka is really a, a very interesting company to work for, with a lot of drive for uh, for innovation and for uh, very global. So it really gives you, especially if you're thinking about a job to start or even at some point to to enter the robotics world. It also offers a lot of entry points view, via different uh, positions, different fields, and uh, you will learn a lot. And uh, I think it's it's nice. It's a very good thing to to work for a leader in a in a market, um, and really to to work on on innovative technology. So I would definitely recommend. Thanks, Kajina. And and uh, and and uh, are kind of I'm just thinking of kind of ways into to, to Kuka. Is it a matter of just like you did, getting all these kind of you know a, a great kind of body of qualifications, and then looking for a suitable uh, job in in one of the companies you're interested in, or should people look at alter internships as well, apprenticeships, th these kind of paths? It it depends at what uh, level, what what experience you have, what step in your career you're in definitely uh, you can do internships there are also uh, students doing their uh, usually master thesis there are some cases of, of bachelor thesis um but a lot do their masters uh, there are also people who are doing their phds um partially at the company and partially at a at a university um of course, the, the, the standard applying way, I would say, but uh, you can also try reaching out uh, at different uh, events. Um, so I would say multitude of, of, of possibilities depends where you are in your in your career and whether you already bring some experience or you're just starting. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. And and, and Helba and, and, and Mary say, is that the same for you if someone really wanted to kind of get get, a, get into a career in researching and in academia and robotics? What would you suggest they do? Apply for the jobs you think you can do and you'll like, because often uh, it's similar to the PhD position. Sometimes they say these are the requirements, but actually, if you apply and you show you can do the job and you prove you're in the interviewing process that yeah, you're keen and you can do the job. That's that's fine. That that's how I got into it. I just applied. I didn't really think I could get the job. I didn't have a PhD when I hadn't even started when I applied for my first job as research assistant. Um, and I got it. And I know a lot of people that uh, got jobs in academia that way. They didn't think they could get it. They applied. They proved they could do it, and they got it. Um, that sadly comes sometimes with a lot of rejections. But I'd say just keep going. Um, because it's the same in industry or in academia, keep going. Uh, rejections is part of the game, let's say. Um, just don't get disappointed. 
That's great, Marissa. Thank you very much. And Helmut, any last advice? Um, yes, come to Bristol. We have uh, MSC in robotics. We have three. We have bio robotics. We have aero robotics and a general robotics. We have a big robotics lab. Um, you can do a PhD in robotics as well. Um, but um, yeah, apply for as many that you're interested in. But if you apply for any kind of uh, um, positions, don't send the same letter to everyone. I think this is a big turn off. Um, make it specific why you go to this specific university, specific program. You don't have to rewrite everything, but at least certain sections should be clear that this is a letter that could not be sent to another university, uh, just as a tip if you apply for, for something in academia. An industry very likely as well, I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think that is really good advice there, actually. Yeah, I, I, I agree. agree. <laughs> um, well, well, look, many, many thanks, everyone. We, we've reached the end, and uh, I, I've really enjoyed this. It's been it's, it's been a real honour chairing this panel, and, and thanks so much. Uh, it, it's been really great um, with, with with such uh, amazing people as Katagina, Helmer, and, and Mary Say. So, many thanks, everyone. At robotics is there are loads of ways in and loads of ways out of robotics. It's a brilliant thing to work in, and and we really uh, couldn't wish you more luck in uh, in hopefully joining the industry. So um, thank you very much indeed. Bye. Thank you thank very you. much. Bye. Thank you, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye.